Hello, everyone. Welcome to the International Methods Colloquium. Uh, my name is Jess Nessery. I'm an Associate Professor of Politics and International Affairs at Wake Forest University. The IMC is a periodic online interactive seminar discussion on the application of quantitative statistical methodology to the social sciences, sponsored by Wake Forest University uh, and also sponsored by Springer Publishing. Uh, this week's speaker is Dalson Figueiredo uh, from the Universidade Federal de Pernambuco in Brazil and also currently visiting Oxford University, which you can probably see in the wall behind him there. Uh, the talk is entitled Corruption in Brazil, Evidence from a New Conviction Dataset. And as you can also see, this is joint work with Nicole Jans and Kaio Malkias. Uh, Dalson's talk is going to last between 30 to 40 minutes, after which point we will take questions from the audience. You can ask a question using the Zoom Q&A button that appears at the bottom of your webinar window, and you can ask a question at any time during the talk, but all questions will be held until the end of the presentation. If you wish to ask a question via audio, uh, please indicate this in the Q&A text box or raise your hand using the raise hand button. Uh, otherwise, I will read your question aloud during the Q&A period. Uh, a link to the paper and slides will be available in the Zoom webinar chat window so that you may refer to it throughout the presentation. Uh, and now I'd like to welcome Dawson Figueredo to the IMC. Welcome. Thank you, Justin. Thank you for the invitation. And you, you just got my name totally right, Figueredo. It's, it's not easy to get, so <laughs> well, congrats. Yeah. Small miracle. Hey, okay, everyone. Hi. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. I don't know from where or when uh, you, you are watching this presentation. I just hope that you are enjoying. Like uh, Professor Justin just said, uh, in addition to myself, I have two colleagues here working for me, uh, Nicole Jans and Kalamaya Kias. Uh, Nicole, at the time that we began this research, she was a professor at Nottingham University in Cayush. He was an undergrad student uh, back in our political science department in Brazil. Now he's a master's student, and he's very soon will be applying for a PhD program in, in the US. So uh, let's do it. Uh, like the, uh, as the title uh, gives, gives it away, is a, a data uh, collection project. So by the end of the day, the final product here will be uh, like a spreadsheet with a bunch of variables and cases and all this information organized in a, a matrix format in order that the extraction of knowledge will be easier in, in, uh, if you compare to other types of data organization. So, yeah, and also, I can, as you can see by the title, is, is uh, the subject matter of uh, our data collection project is uh, corruption. So, yeah, uh, let me give you a little bit of context uh, before uh, we, we move on. So, this data project is, in fact, is embedded in a more ambitious and comprehensive, comprehensive uh, research agenda. Uh, to promote transparency in Brazil. So we got this grant from the British Academy. We also got funding from uh, the folks in, in Berkeley, in this, in the Initiative for Transparency in Social Sciences. And the idea of this uh, more general project, it was to promote, uh, to transfer the tools from academia to the public uh, institutions. So we designed this uh, project, this, uh, this agenda in three dimensions. So the first one was more educational. So we just include in the curriculum of under, undergrad and graduate program, uh, subjects as transparency and reproducibility in open science and p-hacking, you know, all this kind of open science uh, stuff. And uh, I, I started with my own department because it was much, much easier and faster and cheaper. But then we started to contaminate uh, other programs. So uh, this was the first dimension. So the second one is what I call more policy oriented. So we organized these workshops with public servants. And the idea was to train them uh, on transparency and mostly data sharing. So we were very um, preoccupied with the fact that most of the present institutions, they, they had a lot, of, a lot of data on, on, on the public, but they not, do not release it in a systematic or in a, in a more uh, research format. So the idea was try to, to make them uh, try to understand the, the role of transparency 
uh, in the display of public information in order to foster uh, social accountability. The, finally, the third dimension that we organized our project was uh, the one that I'm talking today, more focused on data. And the basic idea, it was to find an institution in Brazil that uh, holds a lot of information, a lot, a lot of data, but for some reason, they were not able to release to the public. So uh, luckily, we, we found it. And then this project, uh, I'm talking today, how well, the steps that we did to try to, to help them to release uh, better and more reliable information. So uh, we got uh, different products so far. So this is a, a new project, but we have different, very interesting projects so far. And I'd like to highlight two of them. Uh, so the first one, we, pub we published the first paper on transparency and reproducibility in Brazil. So we were like, very glad to be a pioneer in this area. And, and after we published our paper, uh, a second paper was published assessing uh, data sharing in Brazilian political science. So yeah, we, we were very proud to, to start this movement, movement in, in Brazil. The second product that I'm very proud of, of this project is that was uh, every year, the Brazilian government awards uh, the, the, uh, the best PhD thesis in the country. And uh, last year, we got this prize. So Rodrigo Lins, he wrote uh, his PhD on survival of democracies. And uh, his PhD is 100% reproducible. So if you go to his uh, OSF webpage, you are able to download all the data. You can uh, copy all the scripts and you can reproduce the same figures, the same drafts, the same residual analysis that he did in his, his, in his thesis. And this is not a, a trivial thing. So I'm in Oxford right now. And if you think about like Cambridge and Harvard and Princeton and Yale and uh, Stanford, just pick one, how many departments you can go there and, and, and reproduce the, the, the thesis uh, from the beginning, from, from, the, from the start to the end. So uh, we was, it was a, a, a very important award for us and we are very uh, proud of it. So now that you, you have more context about our uh, project, uh, I'd like to outline the, the reminder of the presentation. So I'm starting by reviewing, like briefly reviewing, uh, how the scholarship literature uh, deals with the measurement of corruption, mainly the economics and political science uh, literature. After that, I, I want to describe the, the data that we use in the methods. So as long as this is a, a transparency project, we want to be very uh, crystal clear and upfront with all the problems that we had during this data collection. Um, after that, I'd like to show you some results. So in this presentation, I'm focusing on the more descript results from, uh, from the, our data sets so folks can see the potentials and what can be, can be done with this data. And finally, in the, the final section, I will give you some conclusions and, and also emphasizing uh, the shortcomings and the limitations of our, our data so that people uh, can easily understand what they can do and cannot do with uh, this information. Okay, so as any scientific project should go, we started by doing a, a literature review. So here uh, we use the publish or perish software to look for uh, papers and books on corruption. So after some filtering, we selected only papers. We've, we we came up we ended up with a sample size of 746 papers published from the beginning of the century until 2021. And when you run it uh, as a word cloud, you can see the, the distribution of the most frequent words. And the like the most frequent word is it's political. And despite the fact that most of the papers are published in uh, economics journal, uh, the, the main 
content matter of these papers are is, is political. For me. So jokes aside, please, people for economics, go to study inflation and leave uh, corruption for the political science scholars. Uh, the second most frequent word in this review was anti-corruption. And maybe here is, is a kind of institutional effort of agents to counteract uh, the problem. And then we start to dig in this literature in uh, uh, the, the third and the fourth uh, most frequent uh, words are evidence in analysis. So we start to, to read these papers and, and, and organize the structure, the contents of these papers on, on a data set, on a separate data set. And what, what uh, pop up, what came out of this review was a, a concern of the political science and economic scholarship with uh, measurement uh, problems. So uh, this is a slide from Professor Oyo Hellman. He presented uh, his talk in, in, a, in a conference in the King's College in London. Uh, I was able, fortunately, I was able to attend. And the, 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 the main question in this area is how bloody hell do you measure corruption? So and as long as we start to dig in this literature, we spotted uh, three different strengths in the literature that I will explain uh, in, in a bit. But the most uh, popular conclusion in this area is that uh, corruption as any crime will be always underestimated and we should make our peace with it. So regardless of the method, regardless of the technique that, that you are using, you are only measuring a fraction of it. For some methods, so for some approaches, maybe you could, you could go a little deeper. For other approaches, you'll be on the surface, but uh, you never will be able to capture the, the whole uh, phenomenon. And this is the, 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 the assumption that we are using here. So, like I told you, uh, in this literature, there are, there are three uh, strengths. The first one is to focus on perception and experience. In this, uh, this literature, uh, is, uh, you rely, relies a lot in survey research. The most uh, popular measure in this area is from the trans international transparency. That is uh, the, the perception of corruption. So every year they release this, this, this data. Uh, also, they have information on experience. So they, they ask questions for people if they, they have a direct or indirect experience with, with corruption. This is the first trend. There is also a, a promising uh, literature on, on the subject using experimental designs. So, uh, with this, this, with the using of experiments, you can um, control, you can isolate uh, your confounders, uh, but you have problems of external validity. So in these experiments in, in this area are mainly uh, from field and from, from the lab. And finally, the, the third strand that we, we, we found out is the papers that focus on administrative data. So mainly, uh, rely on policy records or judicial hearings. Uh, usually uh, it's very unstructured data that people uh, take as PDFs and then uh, after some coding and some uh, effort, they, they transform it in, in, in a spreadsheet format that's more easily uh, to, to analyze. So uh, here I, I have some examples of the, the of each strand. So here is the first one, the corruption perception index. But uh, realize that here you are not measuring the corruption or the observed corruption, the corruption itself, just how uh, people uh, perceive, perceive that. And maybe they can correlate, but maybe they, they can be uh, un unrelated at all. So it is not, it's not uh, uh, a, a direct measurement of corruption is only uh, the, the perception. Uh, on the, the right side, the, the bar graph, it shows uh, information from LAPOP, the LAPOP, 
and they ask questions about uh, corruption victimization. The questions are asked in the individual basis, and then they aggregate this data by, by country, usually by country, to show uh, the distribution of a given uh, variable. Uh, the second strand, like I told you, is based on experiment design, and that is uh, this piece that was recently published in the American Political Science Review by Trevor Insert, and he, he did a, a meta-analysis comparing the effect of information, uh, group information on vote share. And what he found out is that while field experiments tend to return no results, uh, survey experiments, they are more likely to, to retrieve a statistically significant result. So in this kind of uh, approach, the scholars, they have more, more control of the me measurements, but it's very hard to, to provide any kind of data that's compar comparable across countries, for instance. And finally, uh, the third string that I, I told you uh, that is more focused on administrative information. Here in the US, there is the public, there is the public integrity section from the Department of Justice, and they have been collecting uh, data since uh, 1978. And every year they release these reports that scholars uh, take, transforming a spreadsheet, and then you have uh, estimates of the prevalence of for corruption measured by convictions. And there is, uh, of course, uh, advantages and shortcomings in using this kind of data, but this is the, the, the kind of information that you tr we try to replicate in Brazil. So we found out a, a very similar source of this kind of information, but that was lacking transparency. So we decided to use our project to, to to collect this data, to, to clean this data, and then to release to the public. So as long as this is a, a data project, uh, you can go to our uh, OSF uh, link, and you can have access to all our material. So you have access to the raw data, you have access to the clean data, you have access to the R scripts that we, we developed. And we decided to share the data uh, before publish the paper. And I know that is usually in, for the most part is the other way around, right? First you publish the paper and then you release the data or sometimes you never release it, you release the data in fact. And like most just recently, the American Journal of Political Science Review and American Journal of Political Science, they start to require as a mandatory, the, the, public, uh, the public sharing of, of, of material. But uh, before that was very unlikely that scholars you share their data freely. So we decided to take the opposite direction and make all the data uh, available in free and public before we, we get any uh, paper, paper from it. So uh, in Brazil, the, 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 the Brazilian Justice Department, they created a very similar uh, institution to, re to, to release and to, to publicize data as in the US. So if you go to this website, the Cadastro Nacional de Condenações Civis por Ato de Improbidade Administrativa is basically a, a data uh, repository on administrative, administrative malpractices. So at some point, uh, the Department of Justice decided to uh, collect all the judicial decisions that was made in Brazil at different levels and to include in a public data set. So if you go to the, the, to the, the website, you can uh, dig for it. So you can uh, look for uh, the court cases based on, on four main variables. The first one is the judicial level. So you can choose between state, federal, electoral, superior, and military. In the, in the uh, US, uh, the data from the PIN is only uh, related to federal cases. So this is one of, of the advantages of these data sets you can compare across the uh, judicial level. The other variable that you can go after is the type 
of the person that is prosecuted. It can be an uh, individual like, like me, like Professor Justin, or it can be also a, a corporation like an Apple or, I don't know, IBM. And it's also possible to, to, to pick, to, to select between those types. Uh, the other variable that you can use is like a social security number, but it is very tricky because you, you, want, you have to know all the numbers in order to, to get the information. And so it's very unlikely that you, you, you have this kind of data to begin with. And finally, you can look for the name of the convicted, on the name of the defendant. So it also is a string variable, is extremely sensitive. So any, any word that you spell wrong, you be not able to, to, to find the data. But once, once you, you, you get your information right, you will see a list of all the judged cases in Brazil that relates to administrative malpractices, corruption, money laundering, bribery, diversion of public funds, graft, uh, fraud in procurement, just to name a few. And the last time that they check it, they have almost 7,000 uh, uh, court cases. And the problem here is that they, they give the information per case. So you have to, to click in, in the link to, to, to retrieve the information, like when the case started, what, what was the punishment, what was the crime. So it's very, uh, it's unfeasible to, to collect by hand. So I, I, I wrote to them asking for the data. So uh, and basically I, I wrote, I said my name. Hi, I'm a professor in political science. And this is a very unique uh, data set. Please, could you share the data so that you can analyze and share it with the public? And one, uh, one day after my request, they answer and they said, they said no, sorry, the data is restricted, restricted to the justice staff. So, well, we had a problem, right? Because this is public data. It's from the public interest to, to get to know which politicians, for instance, are being uh, uh, prosecuted for corruption, but the public are not able to find out this information. So we came up with a plan. So how can we extract this data uh, with very few resources that at the time we had and do it in a, in a reproducible and uh, easy way? So we came up with our R code and here I'd like to public uh, say thank you to, to Denison Silva. He's a, a kind of R expert and he was very helpful in improving the code and every time that we had some we had some, some trouble. We, 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 well, we were in touch with him and he, he was also very helpful. So we came up, came up with this code that emulates uh, human behavior and collects all the information. So after we run this code, we end up with a, a data set with six, uh, 5,000 uh, court cases and almost 20,000 are corruption related. So as long as we have the crime, the, the, the description of the crime, we can use content analysis to uh, separate which, which cases are related to corruption and which cases are related to other crime. So we have murder in the data set. We have uh, traffic, uh, drug traffic. So there's a, a lot of potentials for folks that stood like criminology or sentencing, as I you explained to you in a little bit. So we have uh, data that is disaggregated by justice courts. So we can then aggregate this data by city and by state. So we can produce uh, time, time series cross-section data in a very easily uh, format. Now we have, we have more than 50 variables. So after we collected the, the institutional, institutional variables from the own data set, we, we collected also social and economic variables from the cities and from the states so that folks could easily try to correlate uh, these variables with the, the variables that are interested in. 
in, in, in front of the most important, we collected the specific crime committed by each defendant. So if you go to our website, to the OSF website, uh, you are able to see our code book that has all the descriptions of the variables with the, the type of the variable, the format, the description, the source in the link. Uh, in particular, for this presentation, uh, I'd like to, to briefly talk to you about four types of corruption that we were able to identify, identify to spot in the data set. So that is the narrow definition of corruption that's more active and passive. So it's when a public official offers or receives uh, 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 economic advantage to do or not to do something. And this definition is regulated by the Brazilian criminal code, but it can also be found in the literature that uh, we provided information here. Uh, the second type of corruption is what we call public corruption. And this is a more general uh, variable that includes any type of crime that could be committed by a public servant. So as long as you, are, uh, you have a, a job uh, in the government, in any crime that you commit against the, the, the government could be framed as a public corruption. The private is, is, is similar, but when the, the defendant is not a, a, a public servant. And the, the last one is, is the administrative corruption. And this is more related to the administrative malpractice. And like this kind of data was the data that Ferraz Fenner, they used in the uh, American Economic Review paper. So we are very proud of, again, to release a data set that could be used to replicate the results of Ferraz and Fina and to advance their findings. OK, let's see some results. So uh, using a sample of almost six, six uh, 5,000 uh, court cases, uh, we, we found out an uh, average of 3.548 years to judge. So for the best of my knowledge, this is the first estimate of how long uh, a Brazilian uh, judge takes to, to, to judge uh, a court case. Uh, so yeah, this is the, for the best of my knowledge, is the, the first time that someone uh, have this estimate. And on the, on the right, we have the, the same type of analysis, but now focusing on corruption uh, cases. And as you can see, the, the length to judge is, is much higher. We don't need here like a t-test or a mean comparison to, to, to evaluate that in Brazil, corruption take, takes longer to be judged when you compare it to, to other crimes. So this is the, the first finding of, of these the data sets like it's, it's very descriptive, so folks in this area could try to, to explain why and, 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 and go deep with other, other analysis. Uh, another potential of this data, as I told you, is a cross-section data, so we can uh, evaluate the, the variation uh, across time. And as you can see here, uh, there are the Brazilian states and to judge a corruption case, it can vary from almost 10 years, 9.3 years. In Amazonas is the state in very north that's uh, that is most uh, shared area with Amazon, to uh, almost five years in the Brazilian DC. Here in the, the graph is DF. And on, on the right, you can see the map. It's only the geographical display of the same information. And uh, another potential of the data set is to explore uh, some uh, speci special dependencies between the data that we collected. Uh, uh, regarding the types of corruption that I, I mentioned, when we look to the, for the distributions of, of those types, we clearly see that this data set is most representative from administrative corruption. It's almost 
90, 93% of the sample uh, is of this type of data. And this, in, in this file, this is, makes totally sense because when the Department of Justice uh, created this data, the main idea was to be a repository for administrative malpractices. So it seems that if you are, if you were, if you are interested in studying uh, administrative malpractice in Brazil, you can use this data and you would be probably a, a valid measure of the thing that you, you want to measure. Uh, here we have the comparison of time to judge across judicial levels. So different from the data in US that is only available for the federal court cases. In Brazil, we have information for the military, state, and superior uh, courts. As you can see, military and superior, the sample size is very small. So uh, it's very unlikely that this information will be helpful at all. But for federal and for state uh, levels, uh, folks can uh, use this information and again, try to, to build models to explain variation, to explain uh, the severity of the decisions, to explain uh, who got get away and who got punished, these kinds of things. Uh, here, I have a comparison between the time to judge, so the time to, to, the, to judge the court case, comparing corporations and individuals. And as you can see by the survival uh, plots, the survival uh, lines, they are quite apart, which means that the time to judge uh, these cases is quite different. So we, if you, we look to the average, on average, a corporation uh, that is prosecuted by group in Brazil, the court case will take about 7.36 years. If you are uh, prosecuting uh, a human being, this is a little bit quicker. It's about six years, 0.27. In this information could be very helpful to the folks that study access to justice. So there is this book from Capalet in Garth, and they discuss which uh, factors explain the higher or the lower uh, access to just of people. So yeah, uh, in Brazil, most of the, the uh, research on, on law is, is more theoretical and in, in lack, in, in, in it lacks a lot of data. And now is, uh, I believe that this, this data set offers a, a great opportunity to advance this area more empirically. Here is the same idea of comparing two groups but now we have male and female, and different from the other graph, you can see here that the survival probability, they are very close. So the, the curves, they are, they are very close to each other, which means that there is, there is no statistically, statistically significant difference between them. Uh, and for the people that study sentencing, for instance, this is a, a, a very cool information. So you can, you can uh, advance uh, the scholarship literature on sentencing in Brazil now with this data set as well. Uh, here, um, we are comparing the time to judge, the length of to, to, to judge the case, comparing crimes that has a punishment that you go to jail and crimes that you are not, that, that the punish is, is, is not related to go to, to, to prison. Like you can receive fines or you can do criminal services. And as you can see, the, the type of crime that you go to, to, to prison, on average, the, the Brazilian uh, court case, they, they tend to judge more quicker, quicker than the, the, the other type of crimes. The difference is, is, is huge. Uh, we also collected information over time. So here is the number of cases that we found out on administrative corruption cases over time. And as you can see, there is an increase uh, beginning in the 2002, 2003. The red dot line represents the creation of the CNG, which is the institution that released this kind of, of data. So the, 
the idea to create a repository came up uh, after the, the, the creation of the CNG in the collect data before and after its creation. As you can see as well, in 2018, there is a, a, brutal, uh, a huge drop. So folks should be aware that maybe uh, for, 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 from the analysis to not consider 2018 um, even to, to update our data, or maybe, I don't know, with some kind of waging or something. Uh, here uh, I have the time, to, the, the time to judge, the how long it takes to judge over time. So if you talk with any Brazilian, they you say to you that the most prevalent problem of Brazil, of the just in Brazil, is the time is too slow. And we, we, what we have here is that the time to judge at least is, is, is decreasing over time. So at the beginning of the, the the time frame was about 12, 14 years, and now is less than two years to get a final decision in, in a corruption court case. So this is good news, right? Uh, here we standardized the time to judge the length to judge the cases in the corruption rates. And the corruption rate is the number of court cases normalized by the number of people. Is the standard measure to, to the standard procedure to, to measure it, and uh, there is no uh, clear uh, pattern here, like positive association or negative association. But we can uh, see how uh, states uh, vary in these two dimensions. In some states, like the Amazonas, this AM, the uh, is very slow. So the, 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 the judicial courts are very slow to, 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 to judge and the corruption rate is below the average. So there's a, a kind of a typology that can be introduced here and people, again, folks can uh, try to explain this variation. And finally, uh, how trustful is this data? So the final step uh, in our descriptive efforts it was to correlate our corruption conviction uh, rate with other measures that are, uh, that are available in the literature. And as I told you, there's the paper from Ferraz and Finan, and they, they used uh, the same data in several papers, in fact, and also from uh, Batista. Uh, she collected data uh, from the, the same uh, type of corruption in for some, some cases, we, we did find a, a correlation, but not a positive correlation as we expected, but a negative correlation. And if you are thinking to ask me, ask me why is that, I have no clue. Uh, maybe, uh, the, so the, the first thing that we thought that maybe we have a, a, a more comprehensive time series in, uh, and it, it can have some random fluctuation over there or maybe because of the approaches that was uh, widely different. So for Heisman, uh, they, they, they had a, a field experiment and they collected information in a, 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 on very uh, few cases in Brazil in as long as you have information for the, the whole country. So I don't know uh, yet, but uh, the, the likelihood, the probability of to, to find the correlation of this uh, size is, is, very, uh, is very unlikely. So, at least is a, is a first sign that our that there is some sign uh, some signal in our data. Uh, okay, uh, some conclusions here. So uh, the corruption related cases they take longer to be judged in Brazil. So this is the first uh, uh, empirical evidence uh, for the best of my knowledge. There is a significant significant special variation over time. So there is some room to try to build uh, explanatory models. Uh, most of the corruption cases in this data set are from the administrative type. So uh, there is a, a, a whole research agenda that can be advanced in this area. The military justice is the quickest. The state justice is the slowest. Uh, as, it, as you, we, we saw, uh, court cases with corporations, they, they, they take longer to be judged 
and maybe this could be explained by the, the amount of resources that corporations can spend to defend themselves during a court case, for instance. So this is an, an, another line of inquiry that can be uh, looked for. We did it not, we, we, we did not find any difference between uh, gender. So there is no gender effect to judge, on, to judge corruption cases in Brazil. The court cases with incarceration are judged faster than the crimes that uh, not put you in jail. The number of convictions, uh, college convictions in, in Brazil is increasing over time and the average time to judge is decreasing over time. And again, by the best of my knowledge, this is the first time that uh, someone uh, came up with this information about the Brazilian judicial system. So uh, about the limitations. So we have um, a lot of, of limitations and I would like to be very uh, crystal clear and upfront uh, with them. So we have a lot of missing data for some years or for some states, there is no information at all. And we don't know uh, why it's happening because every judge are supposed to, to include this information uh, in the data. So I think that my time is running out and thank you. All right. Uh... Thank you very much for that presentation, Dawson. Uh, at this point, Dawson Figueredo is available to take questions from the audience. You can ask a question using the Zoom Q&A button that appears at the bottom of your webinar window. If you wish to be recognized and ask your question via audio, you can either uh, raise your hand with the raise hand button or indicate this in the Q&A text box. Otherwise, <clears throat> I will read your question aloud during uh, the Q&A period. So uh, I'm gonna start with a couple of questions that I had. The, the first one I want to do is go back to um, the distinction you drew between four different kinds of corruption. Um, I, 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 you know, you had a lot of things to cover in your presentation. And so the, I think uh, in terms of engaging with the corruption measurement literature, this is going to be one of the key uh, things that um, people like me uh, would be interested in. What's the difference between, um, for example, uh, narrow corruption and administrative corruption? Um, and and um, is it the case that pro public, it sounds like public corruption is just any crime committed by a public official, like murder? Um, uh, what, how does that relate to private corruption? Okay, should I answer now? Yes. <laughs> okay, so narrow. Uh, if you go to the, the Brazilian legislation, there are only two types of corruption. They call active and passive. So in order to be recorded as narrow in our data sets, the, the, the type of crime should be only those two, active or passive, which means that someone offered you some money or economic benefits, or you ask it for it in order to do something. This is the, the, the definition of narrow. From the administrative, is a whole different legislation in, in Brazil is not defined by the, by, as a crime, but just, just as, as a, a malpractice. And recently, the Congress, they just changed the law. So in order for a, a, a public servant or a, may, a mayor or a governor to be um, uh, prosecuted by administrative malpractice, they, they have to prove in the court of law that the, the defendant wanted to produce the result. And the people, the people from transpa the trans for Transparency, for instance, they, they were very upset because it's, it's impossible to, to, to prove the subjective intentions of the defendant in, in doing this crime. So it was a, a very uh, kickback, I don't know, uh, on the on the on the on the fight of corruption in Brazil, I know if if, if it helped or not. But just to say that from the administ administrative malpractice is uh, things that are related to uh, more administ administrative uh, uh, kind of things. So uh, 
public public procurement or allocation of public resources. And it's not that you are stealing for the government, but maybe if you do something that is not according to the law, you can be prosecuted by it. And what about um, the difference between public and private corruption that you uh, are drawing? Okay, so for the to be to to be uh, prosecuted by public corruption. So if a, if a, a public servant committed murder, as you said, he will be prosecuted for murder, not for for public corruption, because there is a section in the Brazilian Criminal Code that gives you a list of all the crimes that could be uh, committed by a public officer. So for instance, if I, if I go online and I include false information in, in a public uh, websites from the government, this could be, uh, I, I could be uh, prosecuted for public corruption because, because, because this uh, crime is in, the, in this type of list. And for the private is, people that do not work for the government. So it's, this, it's a different type of crimes, but if you are engaging in any kind of activity that could hurt uh, the, the public funds or could hurt the uh, uh, public administration, but you do not have a public job. So the public and private corruption uh, is essentially an enumerated list of things. Um, exactly. In, the, in some legislation. And exactly. there's no overlap between, for example, narrow corruption, which sounds like bribery. Um, that's, that's essentially what that sounds like. There's no overlap between that and public corruption, for example. So bribery is one, is one of the crimes that you could be prosecuted in public corruption. But you not be, in, uh, but you not be the narrow corruption, uh, or, or an active or passive, because there is a, a, a particular definition, a, a particular legal legal definition of it. So, like uh, bribery or graft, or I have a list here, um, like mon mon money laundering. So, if you're if you're a, if you're a public servant and in in, you engage in money laundering, you, you will be persecuted for public corruption. So like narrow corruption, um, what does that correspond to in terms of like a, a, a crime? Like is it embezzlement? Like literally stealing uh, money from the treasury? Because I'm trying to figure out what the difference is between narrow corruption and public corruption. Because like the legal definition, so if you take the law, is to offer uh, any uh, resource, money, benefit, or goods in order to uh, achieve uh, uh, a private benefit. So it's pretty close to the definition, to the uh, theoretical definition of corruption that you see in the literature. It's the exchange of uh, the use of public office for private gain. But that's not bribery? Yes, it should, also, should be bribery, but in the Brazilian legislation, uh, each crime is defined by a different name. So you, so you can even be prosecuted for different crimes. So in the data set, uh, this is a string variable. And for a lot of cases, you have like active corruption, moon laundering, and embezzlement. And then hmm. we created, we, we created uh, dummy variables to say uh, if that uh, crime is connected to which legal definition. Uh, and so about the, the data, uh, you mentioned there are 18,860 cases of corruption-related crimes in the data set. Is that a sample or is that the universe of all cases? It's a sample. Mm -hmm. But how this sample is representative from the universe, I don't know. And it's mm -hmm. impossible to know because like, so maybe now you are thinking, okay, this is crap, da it's crap data. And maybe for this point of view, it's totally crap, but we, we, we don't have any uh, way to overcome uh, this. Uh, well, I wasn't count. thinking that. What, what I was okay. thinking was, uh, for example, if you're tracking the number of cases over time, right? 
if it's a sample, then um, what I'd want to know is, is the probability of drawing an observation, um, you know, equal over time, right? So that we're not getting some sort of sampling bias um, or uh, in terms of, let's say, adjudication time, right? Because it, it's taking less and less time to adjudicate cases. Are cases that are adjudicated uh, longer, do they have a higher chance of getting selected? Like that's, that's one thing I wanted to know. Yeah, so uh, there is a, another data set from the Department of Justice that mm -hmm. they give aggregate data uh, by state with the number of case loading, the number of judges, and a, a, lot, of, a, lot, a lot of stats that we could use to at least uh, wage this information. So mm -hmm. we could calculate how many uh, corruption-related related cases you have in that state compared to the whole case loading in that year, for instance, is one way to go. Uh, but uh, besides, uh, beyond that, I don't know how to, to overcome. Yeah. Well, uh, let's put a pin in that for a second because we have a question from the audience that I'd like to share. Um, so uh, an attendee asks, uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. With respect to your last slide on missing information in the US, uh, I apologize if you mentioned this. Have you accessed the FBI's Uniform Crime Statistics, the National Crime Victim Survey, or the federal criminal case processing websites, which track data across a wide range of activities, metrics, and time? In addition, uh, Robert Payne's book, The Corrupt Society, has a historic perspective on corruption. Yeah, so uh, for the th thank you for the question. Uh, I, I, I didn't get your name. Uh, they, did, they, 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 it was an anonymous question. Oh, okay. So for the first part, no, I, I, I didn't know this, <clears throat> this first source that you, you, you just said. For the second uh, part, yes. So um, in fact, we, I, I already collected this data from the uh, US and we have uh, in, the, in our work, working paper, we collect, we put the uh, Brazilian data in US data side by side from uh, 1976 from US in 1992 from Brazil until 2018. Uh, there is a, a project that is um, uh, uh, run by a professor from uh, Chicago and he, he released th this data uh, publicly, but it's very easy to, to get the information on time series cross-section from, from the, the US. The very tricky part was to find it for other countries and for Brazil. But from, from the US, it's, it's very easy to get from, from, from the PIN uh, data. But thank you for, for, for the question. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left, and I want to ask a question that I think is a, this, this is a classic uh, measurement question for corruption when it comes to uh, this sort of um, data. So if the number of prosecutions, let's say, uh, is going up over time, uh, or the length of the prosecution is going down over time. Does that mean that there, uh, um, for example, is more corruption because you're having more cases and trying to get through them quickly? Does that mean the government is actually fighting corruption harder, which, which might indicate actually declining corruption, even though um, cases are going up? Um, how do we link sort of the activity of the judicial system to the prevalence of um, naughty things uh, that are happening um, in public office. Okay, great. So uh, th uh, this question uh, was already addressed by the US literature and most of the evidence, they show that higher the resources that you have, higher the state capacity, higher you, you detect and, and yep. prosecute it. And for the Brazilian case, like in, 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 if you look to the literature that you use uh, perception data, you always find a correlation between like, poverty and corruption. Yep. And looking, looking to our data, uh, the poorest states uh, uh, were the same that had a lot of missing cases and a lot of zero information. So we are very, we are not certain, but we are. Uh, you're thinking that the same pattern helps in Brazil as well. So the more rich states in the South that are like well, well known for a low level of corruption in higher standard of, of living, they 
tend to show more persecuted cases compared to the states of the Brazilian poor regions. So the Brazilian poor regions is very unlikely to find any information at all. Hmm. So, Which is kind of counterintuitive because usually you want a higher number to indicate more corruption, right? But it could actually just indicate uh, more anti-corruption activity. That's what be, this one would, would be. Um, all right. Uh, well, uh, actually, I have one last question since we have just a couple of minutes left. What's going on in Amazonas? Uh-oh. Looks like we might have lost uh, Dawson's internet connection. Hmm. Are you there? Yep. Can you? Okay, we had a hiccup there for a second. Yes, I can hear you. So uh, my last question is, what's going on in uh, Amazonas? So uh, so why Amazonas is a, a critical case of judicial slowness, right? So for the first uh, part of the, the paper, like so uh, so uh, this grant that we took. Yeah, so that, that, they, they, they're taking way longer than everywhere, everywhere else. What's going on there? So, uh, the, the, so uh, we've, we've, we did find in, in this sample uh, some uh, outliers, uh, but as long as the, the sample size was like very big, we, we run with and without, and we, it did not change it at all, the descript estimates uh, in the sample. We, we, what we found was very intriguing is that for some and for a lot of cases, we've had neg negative times. And for some reason, the day that the, the, the final date in the data set, in the original data set, that the, the, the court case was uh, judged and prosecuted was uh, before uh, the, the case be began. So uh, it's clearly a, 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 a mistake in, in the original data set. So we, we, we excluded uh, all of, of those cases. And for the Amazon and for Bahia in Espírito Santo, uh, we, we draw a random, a random sample uh, with a, a much smaller number of cases and the pattern is the same. So Bahia in Amazonas, they are always the, the, the first and the second most uh, uh, slow states to, to judge. And you, if you ask me why, I don't know. So uh, we we are abandoned this project. So we are not trying to 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 use this data to, exp to anymore. We are just releasing it, and we just we have this working paper that is the paper that are presenting the data. But as long as uh, Nicole she, she dropped academia, and Caio uh, he has other plans. So. Uh, this this project is just to, to release the data. We are not doing uh, anything uh, anymore with uh, with this data sets. Hmm. Uh, well, it's uh, one o'clock Eastern time, so I'm going to thank Dawson Figueredo for being our presenter this week. Uh, I want to remind everyone that the presentation will be posted to our website shortly after the broadcast if you'd like to share it with a colleague or watch it again later. Uh, I also want to invite everyone to join us on March 18th uh, when, we'll, when, <laughs> when we will host a talk from Catherine Reyes Householder of the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile uh, and also uh, 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 her co-author Santiago, Lobe, uh, Santiago Lopez Caraboni of the Universidad de la República in Uruguay. The talk is entitled Parallel Conjoint Experiments for Measuring Gender Stereotypes and Analyzing Preferences. Please see our website, www.methods-colloquium.com to get more information about this talk. Dawson, thanks very much for being here today. Thank you, Justin. Thank you for having me here. And I hope to see everyone next week. Bye.